So what is a hormone? Hormones are chemicals produced within a specialized gland, which are secreted into the bloodstream to control and regulate the activity of certain cells or organs. These can be thought of as little miniature keys that float through the body and open the receptor, i.e. the lock on the cell. So too many or too few hormones can lead to underactivity or overactivity. Here is a diagram which shows the various endocrine glands within the body. The hypothalamus and pituitary, which lie within and just below the brain, act as a central control for many of the other of the endocrine glands and are often referred to as the leader of the endocrine orchestra. Issues with the thyroid gland, which is the gland that sits in the neck, especially underactivity, are very common in the general population anyway, especially in women. And although some studies have shown an increased incidence of thyroid problems in children and young adults with charge, this has not been shown in all studies. The adrenal glands, which are glands which sit above the kidney, are involved in the fight against infection. And although this is a problem that is seen in patients with charge, there is currently no evidence that indicates that adrenal problems are more common in the charge population. So let's look at hormonal issues in charge during adolescence and adulthood, namely gonadal problems. So firstly, the gonads are the sex glands. So these are ovaries in women and testicles in males. These produce sex hormones, which is predominantly testosterone in males and predominantly estrogen in females, although both sexes actually produce them, although in different amounts. And generally, these sex hormones are produced under the control of drivers from the hypothalamus and pituitary, the so-called hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. So this next diagram shows the feedback loops and hormonal secretion that you see in puberty and adolescence and adulthood in both males and females. So there's drive from the hypothalamus down to the pituitary to production of hormones, so-called gonadotropins, which act on the gonads to produce sex hormones. And you can see that there's also a feedback loop, both at the level of the pituitary gland and also at the hypothalamus. It's also worthwhile remembering, however, that the gonads don't just produce hormones, but they're also responsible for reproduction. So in the woman, these are eggs, so-called ova from the ovaries in girls, and in boys, it's sperm from the testicles. However, there is a difference between the sexes in that girls are born with a full complement of eggs but boys will only produce sperm at the time and after puberty under the influence of hormones. An important pointer is that the same hormones that produce pubertal changes are also involved in the development of the external sex hormones in the womb. So underproduction of these hormones can result in boys in underdescended testicles and also micropenis, a micropenis being defined as a penile length of less than 2.5 centimeters at birth. In girls, the change is obviously much less, but under development of the inner vulval lips, the so-called labia minora can also be seen. In addition, it's noted in both sexes that get, there can be an association between underproduction of these hormones and absent sense of smell, so-called anosmia, which is also another useful pointer. Normal puberty starts at about 10 to 11 years of age in both sexes. In girls, breast development is followed by pubic hair development, is followed by armpit, so-called axillary hair development, and the onset of periods occurs towards the end of puberty. In boys, genital development, including testicular enlargement, occurs first, followed by pubic hair development, and then axillary hair development. It's also worthwhile remembering, however, that 
pubic and axillary hair can both develop under the influence of hormones from the adrenal gland, so-called adrenarche, and may occur independent from puberty. So this diagram is similar to the one that we've previously shown in a slightly simplified fashion, but also shows the level at which testing can occur. So the LHRH test or GNRH test tests the central functioning of the hypothalamo-pituitary axis. And the HCG test, which is used in boys, tests the ability of the testicles to respond to these hormones and produce testosterone. So failure to go through puberty can be due to either a central drive, so-called hypogonadotropic, or it can be due to problems in the gonads themselves, so-called hypogonadotropic or primary hypogonadism. So delayed puberty is defined as lack of onset of true signs of puberty in girls at, great, at greater than 13 years of age, and in boys at greater than 14 years of age. In addition, failure to start the periods, i.e. onset of Medici, greater than 15 years, is also included within this. As I've said, puberty itself may take up to three years. And in some conditions, you can pass part the way through puberty, but get stuck part way through so-called arrested puberty. This is commonly seen in adolescents with charge, occurring in somewhere between two thirds and more than three quarters of patients. And it appears to be more common in boys than in girls. And in charge syndrome, this appears to be due to lack of drive centrally from the pituitary gland. So this is what is known as hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So it's reduced production of sex hormones as a result of central drive. So if there are hormonal problems with underactive hormones, the logic is to replace these hormones. There are, of course, concerns about giving hormone replacement to patients with charge. There are concerns that behavior may get worse, and especially there may be inappropriate sexual behavior. There's the worry about the effect of menstrual bleeding in girls and the possibility of boys getting persistent erections, so-called priapism, in boys. We also know that at times of rapid growth, scoliosis can occur, and this is found in about 50% of patients with charge. And it, the worry is that by giving hormone replacement therapy, that the scoliosis may be way worse. Those are some of the concerns, although generally, if it's managed well, these are not issues. And of course, these must be balanced against the long-term risks of osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is reduction in bone mass sufficient to increase the risk of fractures. Every 10% increase in bone mass is equivalent to a 50% decrease in the fracture rate. And we know that a substantial proportion of bone mass is laid down at the time of puberty and in early 20s under sex hormones and other hormones. So there is a window of opportunity in the teens and early 20s to protect against osteoporosis occurring much earlier than it otherwise would do, i.e. in their 30s and 40s. And this is a window of opportunity that's important to grasp as treating after that will never return the bone mass back to normal. So what are the options for hormone replacement therapy in boys? Well, the treatment generally used is that of testosterone. So just replacing the hormones that are deficient. This can be given by injection monthly, although in adults, three monthly injections can be given. Increasingly, 
patches or gel are also given. And the advantage of these is if there are issues, it can be stopped and with a rapid washout period. And occasionally, if patients are unable to tolerate either injections, patch or gel, then capsules can be used. Now, of course, all that this is doing is replacing the testosterone that's missing. It's not replacing the central hormones that are driving the testicle and also potentially involved longer term in production of sperm. So it's not a natural replacement as such. So some countries, such as the Netherlands, give injections of the gonadotropins, which can be given either by regular injection or in some instances by continuous pump. So whilst there are undoubtedly benefits, but also practical downsides of each of these forms of treatment, we currently don't know which of these is best, although there are ongoing studies going to try and explore this. So in terms of hormone replacement in girls, the ovaries initially produce estrogen, but further on when the periods start, it's a combination of estrogen and the other female hormone, progesterone. Now, estrogen itself and also progesterone can be given orally. They can also be given by patch and there are some potential benefits of using a patch rather than oral estrogen. There are also synthetic estrogens and natural estrogens and it's unclear at present which one of these is better. And longer term, whilst for convenience sake we've often used the oral contraceptive pill because this is easily available, it may also be that traditional hormone replacement therapy may be better and further studies are required to see which of these is best in terms of osteoporosis, bone health and other health indicators. So we've talked about hormone replacement therapy but as I've already said the ovaries produce eggs and the testicle produce sperm. There's very little data at present on fertility in patients with charge, although there are similar conditions where you have hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and anosmia, such as the condition known as Kalman syndrome, where there is more data. As I've said, the gonads produce not only sex hormones, but also produce eggs in females and sperm in males. So merely replacing the hormones won't enable fertility to be achieved. And you therefore, if you're looking at fertility, need to put in gonadotropins, so-called luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And these need to be given either by regular injection or by pump. Again, we have almost no data whatsoever in young adults with charge with this. So the other issue during adolescence is obviously growth and final height in patients with charge, as retarded growth is part of the condition. So I'm going to talk in the latter part about growth and also growth hormone. So this next diagram shows that growth is made up of three superimposed phases. And it's important to remember these as, the, as although they can be described mathematically, the most important thing is that they reflect different controls. So the infantile phase occurs from birth to around three years of age. It's a continuation of the growth curve from intrauterine, i.e. within the womb, and it's nearly exclusively under nutritional, so food control. So children who fail to grow in the first few years of life, it's usually due to nutritional factors, what we often call failure to thrive or weight faltering. The second phase is so-called childhood phase, which occurs from around two years of age up until the age of puberty. This is also under nutritional control, but is also under the control of other hormones such as growth hormone and thyroid hormone. 
And then finally, the third phase, which is the pubertal phase, which we've already talked about before, not only you get pubertal development, you get the growth spurt. And this occurs under a combination of growth hormone and also sex hormones acting together. It's well recognized that children and adolescents with charge show failure of all of these phases of growth. Since this failure occurs at the infantile phase, I think it's very important that children with charge are seen as early as possible, i.e. at diagnosis and beyond, by a pediatric endocrinologist and a pediatric endocrinologist who has access to the charge checklist. In addition to failure of phase one, the infantile one, the pubertal growth phase, phase, phase three is also significantly affected. And although we'll talk about growth hormone later, generally in charge syndrome, failure of the third phase, the pubertal phase, is down to sex hormone rather than growth hormone deficiency. We also know that final height is reduced in the majority of patients with charge syndrome. And this may also be affected by scoliosis, curvature of the spine, which occurs in up to 50% of patients. Of interest, however, estrogen not only causes a growth spurt actually in both sexes, but also causes fusion of the growing ends of the bones. So sex hormone deficiency will often result in patients with charge growing into their 20s or even 30s. An X-ray of the growing ends of the bone performed at that time, a so-called bone age X-ray, will show that the ends of the growing ends of the bones have not fused. As I've said, these phases are affected in many patients with charge. There is a significant amount of growth data internationally on children and adolescents with charge and it will be very beneficial in the future to be able to produce charge syndrome specific growth charts. The growth potential can be assessed using a bone age, which is an X-ray of the wrist that looks at all the growing ends of the bones. Usually, of course, fusion of all these growing ends occurs in the sort of mid to late teens. But as I've said, in children and adolescents with charge, the bone age will often be delayed and you may still see open growing ends of the bones into the 20s and 30s. Growth hormone, as it states, not only has growth promoting effects, but also has some metabolic effects as well, which are directly produced. Classically, children who are growth hormone deficient have a relatively normal birth weight, but are short, are poorly growing, and are relatively overweight for their height with a delayed bone age. Now, some of these features, of course, are also seen in charge, but that doesn't mean that all patients who are short, who have charge, are growth hormone deficient. There are some studies that suggest an increase in the frequency of growth hormone deficiency in charge, and figures of between 12 and 34% have been quoted. But this may reflect the fact that these children are self-selected because they are significantly short. And certainly in our experience in the United Kingdom, the frequency of growth hormone deficiency is quite low. So I hope in this talk, I've discussed some of the long-term endocrine issues. As we are seeing patients living into young adulthood, it may be that some of these conditions are found more commonly than we previously thought. However, I'd just like to review some of the issues and some of the questions that we have. In terms of pubertal treatment and hormone replacement therapy, we know that giving this is protective, but how long should hormone replacement therapy be given for? And more importantly, what's the optimal hormone replacement therapy? I've talked briefly about fertility, and it may well be that this is a potential in some patients, both male and female, uh, with charge, either spontaneously or with fertility treatment. 
clearly if there is the potential for spontaneous fertility, which may occur in some girls with charge, then there would also be an awareness of the need for contraception. We've talked about osteoporosis. Now, osteoporosis is best assessed using uh, a technique called DEXA, which is dual energy X-ray absorptiometry, which is a very sophisticated 3D X-ray process and is not just a simple X-ray. These can be done repeatedly if necessary. There is an issue that it produces a 2D scan on a 3D structure, i.e. bone, and therefore it does need to be carefully assessed both for height and other factors when performing a report. There's also some indications uh, that obesity may be a problem uh, in older patients as they're getting older. Now this may be due to reduced mobility. Uh, it may be due to um, changes in eating. There's very little data about this, but clearly this may also impact uh, on health issues longer term and further data needs to be obtained on this in the future.